Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Well, I got an interesting request the other day from a cook who likes to bake. Could I build a bake center? Maybe one section could be high with a metal top and a section that was a little bit lower with some kind of stone top and plenty of storage down below. So I got out my sketch pad and I'll show you what I came up with next right here on the New Yankee Workshop. I'm going to start by building the carcasses for our cabinets and for that I'm going to be using three quarter inch plywood. The sides will be oak plywood. In this light this appears to be white oak but it's actually red oak. These four by eight sheets of plywood are difficult to handle single handedly here in the shop and it's impossible to rip a piece off the end at the table saw. So I like to reduce the pieces down using a circular saw. I'll cut a piece off which I'll use later. The remaining piece will be cut into four pieces, which will be the sides of our carcasses. Before we use any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Rip it. I just want to stop for a second here and talk about table saw technique when you rip. You might have noticed that my eye was not on the blade. My eye is at the intersection of the piece of plywood and the fence. I want to make sure that it doesn't wander away, giving me an uneven cut. I'm cross-cutting my panels to the correct height and you'll notice that I'm not using a miter gauge or a panel cutter. The only way you can do that is if you have a good rib fence and a sharp blade and a table surface that doesn't drag as you push the piece through. Now I'm ready to build some frames that will join the sides of the carcass at the top of the cabinet. They will also provide support for the countertops and that pull-out tray. I'm using three-quarter inch thick birch plywood, which I've ripped into three-inch strips, and I've cut them to the right length. The pieces that go across the cabinet will need a groove, and the pieces that go the depth of the cabinet will have tenon, so I can make a connection at this corner. I like to make the groove first because it's easier to fit the tenon to the groove than it is to try to make the groove fit the tenon. To make the grooves, I'm using my stacked dado head cutter set up for a quarter inch width and a half inch depth. I've set the fence so that I've got the groove just about in the center, but to make sure that it's milled in the center after I make the first pass, I'll turn it around, put the other face against the fence, and run it through, guaranteeing that I have a groove right in the center. Now I'm ready to form the tenons on the ends of the cross pieces. I've widened the dado head to 5 eighths of an inch. I've installed this sacrificial strip because I'm going to be cutting right to the end of the piece and I don't want the blade to hit the metal fence. I've moved the fence so a half inch of the blade is exposed and I've raised it to approximately the height I want. And I'll make a test piece. We'll check it in our groove, and it's a little too tight. I want it just to be a snug fit, just a fraction of an inch. So I'll raise the blade just a little bit and run the piece through again. Okay, let's see how that works. Just right, just a slip fit. Now it's time to assemble those frames, and I've put glue in the groove and I'm applying glue to each tenon. We'll slip all the pieces together and clamp them. These pieces in the center will help support that piece of marble. Okay, now to finalize the connection, I'm going to use a couple 5 8 inch brads at each intersection. Now I'm getting ready to make some dados in the side pieces, but before I make the actual cuts, I run a sample to make sure that the groove 
matches the thickness of my plywood. These days, plywood can be thinner than three quarters of an inch, so you have to check it with every project. Now I'm ready to make a series of dados in the side panels to receive the fixed shelves and one of those frames that we just made. With my sacrificial strip installed, I've now turned my attention to making some rabbits at the top of each panel, which will receive another one of those frames. And that takes care of the rabbit for the plywood back. This piece of oak plywood with the rabbit will go at the back of the cabinet. The rabbit will pick up the quarter inch backing and the cleat can be used to attach the cabinet to the wall. This piece of birch plywood is the bottom shelf for the cabinet. This is the inside and this is the underside into which I'll fit a piece of solid oak to make the toe kick. This is the first in a series of quarter inch grooves that I have to make in the two fixed shelves which receive the partitions for our tray storage. Here I've laid out for the notch necessary to make the toe kick. And I like to use my square to guide the base of my saw so I get a nice straight cut. Now to finish off the cut I'm just going to use my jigsaw. Well now a little bit of assembly. After putting glue in the groove I simply toenail through with some one and a quarter inch brads. These brads, in addition to the back plywood that's going to go on the carcass, will give the piece a lot of strength. And here's the top frame. Just sits in those rabbits, a little more glue and a few brads. All right, the next piece to put in is that back cleat that I made earlier with the rabbit, and that gets installed with glue and brads. And finally, the quarter inch plywood back. And that slips into the rabbits all the way around and we'll attach it with some 5 8 inch brads. The dividers for the tray storage are just quarter inch pieces of plywood cut to fit. The next step is to cover the exposed plywood edges. So I'm using some pieces of quarter inch thick oak and just installing them with a little bit of glue and some brads. Now the pieces can be a little short on the end because the face frame styles will cover that area. And it's not necessary to put any edging on these top two frames because they'll be covered by a face frame. For the last few minutes I've been making the pieces for the face frame. Three quarter inch thick red oak. I have a couple styles. I have a cross piece here which goes just beneath the drawer. And these two narrow pieces which surround the pull out tray. To join the rails to the styles, I'm going to use a method known as pocket screws. I have this bench top cutter under which there is mounted a router with a 3 8 inch bit. And as I push the lever forward, it will cut a slot for the screw. And as I pull it towards me, a drill bit will make the pilot hole for the screw. Another important part of this system are the screws. They're a special pan head screw with a straight drive, and the tip is made so that it acts like a drill, drilling into the adjoining piece. Without that, I'd be afraid that the pieces would split, but so far we've had really good luck. With a little bit of glue on the edges of the carcass, I can now set the face frame in place, get it aligned, and attach it with some one and a half inch brass. Okay, the last piece to go on the carcass is the toe kick. Well, I had no problem finishing up everything I wanted to do last night, completing the face frame on this lower cabinet. Now I can show you how these pieces are going to go together. This lower piece, which will be the draw storage, is going to have a marble top, and that's going to connect to the side of this taller piece. And I've set it back slightly. The taller piece is going to have a nice zinc countertop. Now the first thing I want to do today is make the door to close in this tray storage area. So I've ripped and jointed four pieces of oak, which will make the rails and styles of the door. They're nice and straight and they're square. Now I can go to my router station and mill the details and the connecting joints. 
I went to my router bit store and got a router bit set. This first bit makes the groove and the speed detail. Then there's a corresponding bit, which actually makes a cope in the ends of the rails to connect all the pieces together. All right, now let's see how that fits. Perfect, a perfect match every time. All right, that's nicely coated. Now we'll just slip it together. Now I'm ready for the panel, which is a piece of quarter inch plywood, oak on one side, luon on the inside. That's just gonna get slipped into the groove, no glue. You just slide that in. And install the other style. The next thing that I wanna build is the pull-out shelf that goes right in this slot. And this will extend the amount of workable counter space for that, I'm using a piece of three-quarter inch oak plywood, and I'm edge banding it with some one and a half inch wide pieces. To strengthen the joint between the solid oak and the plywood, I'm gonna use these biscuits. And the first thing I have to do is cut some slots that are about six inches on center. Using a moisture resistant glue to connect these pieces because this surface is gonna get wet and I don't want it to come apart a little bit of glue in the slots and along the edge of the piece and just slip it on. Using my dado cutter, I've just machined a half inch wide groove and some solid oak. That solid oak is gonna wrap this piece of half inch plywood. We'll be mitering it at the corners and that's gonna become the pull out tray at the bottom of this cabinet. The sides of my tray are mitered on one end first, and since the tray is square, I've set up a stop so that all four pieces will be exactly the same length. For the assembly, I'm just putting a bit of glue in the groove and on each miter. And when all the pieces are wrapped around the plywood, I'll pin them with some brads. Well, now I'm starting to work on the draws. These are the large draws of the lower case, and this half-inch groove is for the plywood bottom. While I still have the half-inch dado in the saw, I've started work on this small draw right here for the utensils, and that groove is for the back of the draw. With the dado head reduced to a quarter-inch width, I've just put a groove in those side pieces for the plywood bottom. I want to make the same groove in the front piece. Here I'm beginning to form the dovetail joints which are going to connect the draw sides to the front. This type of joinery is really a hallmark of fine furniture making. It takes a lot of time to cut these by hand, but with a production jig like this and a router, you can make them very precisely and very quickly. What I have, to have here is a jig with a lot of adjustment features. I start out with my draw side, and I set it even with the edge of this finger on the jig and bring another one over to the other edge. Then I can space out a series of these fingers for the dovetail spacing that I want. They end up all being equally spaced. When I start to use my router, which has a collar on it and a dovetailing bit, I start on this edge, it cuts a slot for half a pin, forms a dovetail, cuts a slot for a full pin, forms a dovetail, another slot for a full pin, and so forth. Now I'm ready to form some pins in the front and back pieces. So the first thing to do is install this piece of scrap plywood that will act as a stop. Then I can remove this backer board that I use to cut the tails to prevent tear out. I then take either one of the front or back pieces that I need to cut the pins in, slide it up against that stop, and then readjust my clamps so that it will hold it securely in place. Okay, that's good. Now I gotta take the finger assembly 
and flip it over and then set the gauge to the same thickness as my material. So for half inch pins, half inch stock, we set it at half inch. And now I'm ready to cut some pins. Okay, let's see how we did. Grab one of the side pieces and see how it goes together. A little snug, but it's going to go in there when I put the glue on. For our assembly, it's just a matter of putting a coat of glue on all the tails and in the sockets of the pin board. And then we just bring them together, take a piece of wood, and drive them flush. Now the bottom. And that just slides down in our grooves. The small drawer has a dovetailed front and the back piece is just set in the dados. And we'll slide in a piece of quarter inch plywood for the bottom of this one and nail it off. This is the first of two pieces of three quarter inch plywood that I'm attaching to the inside of the cabinet so that I can build out so I'll be proud of the face frame for my draw slides. A little bit of glue and some one and a quarter inch brads are used to attach it. Before I install the second piece of plywood, I'm gonna take the time to screw the slide to it. It's a lot easier to do it out here than it is when it's in the cabinet. Now the corresponding part of the slide gets attached to the draw side with a few screws. And then the whole assembly gets slid into the tracks we've already put in the carcass. Okay, let's put this together and see what it looks like. Large drawers have these heavy duty extensions and they'll just slide in. And they'll give us plenty of room for the dry goods and for other baking dishes. Over here I've installed some slides on our pull-out tray and that just slips in and that's going to be for bowls and other baking dishes. And that takes care of all the slides. Now the next thing I want to do is sand the intersections of the face frame flush and also the edges. Now this is part of the job where it's real handy to have a machine like this, a wide belt sander. I've just installed a 120 grit belt and now I'll be able to sand my door and any of my other panels nice and flush. I'll be able to run the piece through and have all my joints come out nice and smooth. Now I have to just take my random orbit sander and hit these rails because there are some very fine marks from going through the sander across the grain. Now I'm installing a couple plywood cleats in between the two frames. I slide them all the way into the side of the cabinet and attach them with some one and a half inch brats. And what those will do is guide the sides of this pull-out shelf. The way to get these draw fronts perfectly centered in the opening is not to attach them to the box when it's out of the cabinet, but attach them to the box when it's in the cabinet. When the box is in place, I take the draw front and center it in the opening, top and bottom and side to side. I like to use these little wedges as spacers because it's easy to make the adjustments. Well, what do you think? Does that look okay to you? I'd say it's good. Now I can tack it from the inside with a couple brads. After pre-drilling some holes, I'm going to permanently attach the draw front with some one-inch screws. Okay, that takes care of the drawers. Now I want to hang the door. I've made a template to mortise for my hinges. The template cutout is a sixteenth of an inch bigger all the way around than the hinge itself. And that's so that I use a 5 8 inch diameter collar and a half inch diameter bit. The collar is going to ride on the inside of the cutout 
and the bit's going to do the mortising. Okay, now I just simply remove the template, and I have a little corner chisel, a special device that has a spring-loaded chisel to make the corners square. Got the little tab of wood left behind, and the hinge should fit perfectly. Now here I've got the cabinet on the side, and here I'm not going to be able to take advantage of my router because it won't fit in by these fixed elements. So I'm going to have to go to the old-fashioned method of mortising. I set the hinge where I want it, take a sharp utility knife, and score the outline. Once I have the outline scored, I can just take a chisel and make a series of cross cuts. Now just remove the material to the correct depth. Okay, now the hinges are attached both to the door and to the cabinet. And we'll slip it together and install the pins. Okay, well that's it for now. No more hardware till we get it in and out of the finishing room. For the finish on our bake center, I'm going to use a fast drying gloss polyurethane. I've completely dusted the piece off and I put this first coat on. After this sits for about three hours, I'll sand it with 220 grit sandpaper, dust it off again, and apply a second coat. And because this is a bake center that's going to get heavy use and there'll be dry goods and wet goods, I think I'll take the time to apply a third coat. After everything's dry for 24 hours, we can put it to use. Well, what do you think of the hardware? We found these on a construction site and they were going to be thrown away. So we just cleaned them up a bit. I think they look great. We found some knobs that matched for the door and for the pull-out tray. And look at this a beautiful piece of granite for the countertop of our low cabinet and we asked the shop to find a way to hold the rolling pin so they glued on a couple small strips. Now for the upper counter we're using something a little bit unusual, zinc. You don't see much of that over here in this country but in France I'm told that it's very popular and in time the top should acquire a nice patina. Let me show you what we're going to build next time. These lightweight portable table saws are very popular and they're even more useful if you surround them with a saw station. This design gives additional outfeed support, it gives a nice table to the right for ripping wide panels, and we even made our own extension fence. And the whole system sits on a very simple support. I'll show you how to build our saw station next time right here in the new Yankee Workshop.